morning everybody and welcome to our HR club which this morning is on GDPR and what do you need to know. So before I hand over to Mark Stevens, who has joined us from the employment team at VWV and is going to take us through the session today, I'm just going to tell you about a couple of other sessions and run through some of the practicalities about today. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Caitlin Annis. I'm the lead HR consultant at uh, Narakee HR. And uh, we run these sessions on a quarterly basis online for anybody who doesn't know um, or who hasn't come along to one before. Um, our next session is on the 11th of May and is going to be um, dealing with handling workplace investigations. So please um, feel free to pop that in your diary. The invites will come out nearer the time. We also have a session that we're running on the 24th of March, which is an in-person session in the Bristol office. Um, it's a half day session on essential HR for line managers. So we will be covering things like how do you deal with grievances, with disciplinary issues, with investigations, um, with conduct. A really practical session, really good for line managers who perhaps haven't had any training on those sorts of things, but have to deal with them as part of their um, daily work. So um, if you're interested in that, it's on our website. Um, please feel free to sign up to that. We'd love to see you there. So in terms of the session today, as I said, uh, Mark is going to run through the session for us. If you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. And I will keep an eye on that as we go through the session and we'll put them to Mark at an appropriate place um, during the session or at the end, if we've got um, questions at the end of the session, then we can deal with them then as well. So um, either ask them as we're going along or, or hold on to them and we can um, have a Q&A session at the end. So I'm going to now hand over to Mark. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Good, good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for joining today's session. I'm an employment lawyer at VWV, but it's fair to say that as an employment lawyer, uh, I'm seeing uh, lots of issues around information, use of information, use of employee data within the workplace. Employees, like, uh, like everybody, have, have the right to request a copy of their personal data of an organisation that holds their personal data. And it's becoming increasingly common for employees to be aware of that right, to be aware of, of the entitlement to request a copy of their personal data. And I'm frequently seeing when advising employer clients that they are fielding uh, an increasing number of subject access requests from individuals who know their rights uh, and know that they can get hold of the information that their employer has got about them, perhaps to support a grievance or when they're in the midst of a disciplinary process to, uh, to, 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 raise other, to raise other issues. So if we go to the first slide, um, I'm going to talk today about subject access requests and particularly within a, an employment context. And I'm going to explain what you as an employer need to know uh, and need to think about when you receive a subject access request and how to respond, what exemptions you might be able to use and, uh, uh, and the, the information that you will need to give the requester. I'm also going to talk about information security. Security is one of the key obligations on a data controller under the GDPR. There's also been some recent case law uh, around uh, data breaches, which I think are quite interesting, and in some cases actually quite useful and helpful for employers. And finally, I'm going to talk about accountability and transparency. Again, some key parts of the GDPR, some key obligations on an employer, or indeed any organisation that processes personal data. But I'm going to try and un unpack what accountability and also transparency means within an employment context. I'm going to talk a little about privacy notices, which are the key part of the transparency obligation in an employer employee context. As Caitlin mentioned, please do ask questions as we go through. Um, 
there'll be opportunities to, uh, to to discuss those questions either as we as we go, perhaps at the end of each uh, individual topic that I'm going to talk about, uh, or of course at the end. So if we go to the first slide, which talks then about uh, subject access requests, I thought it might be useful just to take a quick straw poll amongst the various attendees this morning to understand whether you, your organisation, has received a subject access request in the last year. So you've got the option of saying, yes, you have, or no, you haven't. Please do uh, vote now. Be interesting to see how many of the attendees are ha have experience in or, or recently fielded a subject access request. Well, pr pretty close to a 50-50 split. So, 44%, 21 of the 48 participants have received requests within the last year and, and will know a lot, I'm sure, about what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, whilst the, uh, the, rest, the rest of you, 27 of you, uh, didn't have the, the, the experience of building an SAR in the last 12 months, it may be that you've, you, you, you've had other ones uh, before, before then, but, but, but even so, it's, 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 it's becoming increasingly common, as I mentioned, for subject access requests to be made. Employees are very aware of their rights, as are the representatives, whether trade union or legal representatives of, uh, of those employees. They, they're aware of how powerful a tool a subject access request can, can be for an employee. So if we close the, uh, the poll now and move to the, to the, to the next slide, please. Subject access requests are a request for personal data. And actually that's a really important thing to try and get your, get your head around straight away because in, individuals are entitled to a copy of their personal data. But what is personal data? Well, under the GDPR, personal data is information that is about somebody. So it's biographical information. It's information from which an individual is identifiable. That means that not every single email that an individual sends during their employment is their personal data. For instance, if two employees are exchanging correspondence about a client or a customer, that correspondence is unlikely to amount to one of the employee's personal data and therefore is unlikely to be something that you would need to share with that employee, with one of the employees, if they pursued a subject access request. It's not about them. It's, it's not biographical information that relates to them. So having thought about personal data, let's go back to the, to the right to request personal data. As the slide says, the request doesn't actually have to be in writing. The information commissioner recognises verbal requests for personal data. It's fair to say on its website it discourages requesters from making verbal requests and it suggests that they put those requests in writing, but it's certainly uh, compliant with the GDPR for an individual to ask for their personal data verbally. They can simply say I would like all of the information that you hold on me or I would like to see my personal data. They don't have to refer to the GDPR of course, you don't have to refer to data protection. Um, it's, it's, it's quite easy, it's quite simple for people to make that request. Of course, before 2018, individuals had to pay a fee in order to request that personal data. It was a nominal fee of sort of 10 pounds, but it was still a, a fee that was payable. Following the GDPR, that fee can no longer be charged. Really, there are no opportunities for employers to put significant obstacles in the way of anybody requesting personal data. You can't ask, well you can ask somebody to complete a specified form to make a subject access request, but you can't make that compulsory. You can't force people to make a request in a certain or specific way. There's no reason that you can't suggest that people use a particular method of requesting their personal data, but you can't insist on it or ignore somebody who does it a different way. And that means you can't demand that all subject access requests are made of a particular person within your organization. And that's important because it means that 
a valid request can be made of anybody in your organization. So there is a need to make sure that, that, that those staff who might, be, uh, it, it, who, who might be in a position where they receive a subject access request are aware of what to look out for and aware of how important it is that the, uh, the request is acknowledged and then dealt with relatively quickly. So there's a need to think about training managers, line managers, people with responsibility for lots of staff to understand what a subject access request looks like and why it needs to be dealt with quickly. So if we go on to the next, the next slide, there's certain things that you need to think about immediately when receiving the subject access request. The deadline is one month from receipt, effectively one month from receipt of that, that request to respond to it. There is an opportunity to extend that time frame by a further two months if the request is complex. Now, what, what is a complex request? The GDPR doesn't actually set that out, but I think that in an employment context where you've got years and years of personal data in some cases, or lots and lots of information to review, you may be able to use that position. You may be able to use that argument that this is a complex request and therefore the time frame ought to be extended by that two month period, giving a total of three months to respond. But if you are extending the time frame, you need to think about that relatively quickly. It's possibly unreasonable to wait until the last minute before that one month is up to then write to the requester and say, by the way, we think your request is complex and we're, we're actually going to extend it for a further two months. I think that risks somebody complaining to the ICO and the ICO suggesting that that wasn't a reasonable approach. So calculating the deadline in the first instance is really important and can, giving consideration to whether the time frame ought to be extended because of the nature of the request. The first two bullet points on my slide are also really important. Should you ask for evidence of ID? In an employment context, you're, you're likely to know who the requester is already. Won't always be the case, particularly when you're fielding requests from customers uh, or clients um, it, it, or members of the public even. You, you may need to think about requesting their ID, but in an employment context, it's probably likely you know who they are already. But you do sometimes want to check, particularly if you receive a request from a personal email account, something like that, that you are actually dealing with your member of staff and you don't inadvertently disclose personal data to the wrong person. Asking for clarification is really important. In many, in many circumstances, the requests will be open-ended. As I've said, there's no specific form of words that an employee needs to use to start a subject access request. Asking for all the information that you hold on me is a valid request. So an employer will need to think about whether it ought to ask for clarification of that request in order to locate the personal data requested. It's reasonable to ask an individual to clarify their request for the purpose of better locating their personal data. An employer can't ask an, an employee to ask for less data or, uh, or suggest that what they're asking for is unreasonable. Of course, an employee doesn't need to give a reason. There doesn't need to be a reason for, for their request. And they can ask for whatever they like or, or indeed everything. But it's reasonable to ask for clarification in order to allow you to better locate their data. So the sort of clarification that you could seek would be, could you tell me the date ranges of the information that you are interested in? So asking for a particular year or month or series of, of months or particular dates that they're most interested in, I think is a reasonable request. Similarly, you could ask them to focus on a particular, uh, particular individual, whether they're interested in information that their line manager ha has in their inbox or, the, or correspondence sent between uh, two directors of the organization. Once you have that information, the hope would be that you would be able to locate their personal data more quickly, more effectively. Asking for the clarification is also really important because the clock stops 
when you're asking for that information. So the clock that's ticking in terms of responding within that month, potentially three months, will stop whilst you're waiting for the clarification that you've requested to be provided. Again, it's probably going to land you in a bit of hot water with the ICO if you wait until the very last minute of that month to write to the individual and say, by the way, could you clarify your request, please? I think it's better, again, more reasonable to contact the requester at quite an early point in their request to say, can you clarify the information that you are requesting? Whilst you're then waiting for them to respond, that deadline is, is, is paused. I think it would be reasonable to notify the individual of that fact when you're seeking the, uh, the clarification. Um, can we move to the next, next slide, please? So once you've got the information that you've, uh, the, the clarification that you've, you've sought, um, the, the next thing to do, again, is to review the, the personal data that you've got on file, review the information. Uh, I said in the third bullet point, store information so it's easier to search. Now, of course, uh, there may be little that you can do to really change how you stored information at the time that you've received the request. Uh, but this is a way to, to really think proactively. So for the 27 of you who've not, uh, who've not had the, an SAR within the last 12 months, now, or indeed everybody, now is the time to really review how information is stored and think about working with I, the IT teams that you may, you may have to, to, to test how quickly they can find information, whether it's saved in an easy way to access. Or, or on the system. I talk about uh, saving things on the system, but of course, personal data may be stored outside of the computer system, non-electronic information. There's a, there, there's, I suppose, a, a, a myth that if personal data is written down by hand or on, on notes, on documents, that that information doesn't need to be disclosed in response to a subject access request. That's not quite correct. What, whilst there is a, 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 an exemption, I suppose, for information that's not stored in, a, uh, in an organized system, it doesn't always follow that things that are written down on paper or in workbooks uh, don't need to be reviewed in order to be disclosed. If you have a filing cabinet full of paperwork, then I think it's reasonable to expect that to be reviewed and for the personal data that's in those filing cabinets to then be to then be disclosed. And as above, as I mentioned previously, it's important always when you're looking at the, the disclosure to think about what is personal data. Even though individuals are likely to, to use quite quite vague terminology in their request and ask for everything that you have in relation to them, everything that you have in relation to them won't be their personal data. As I've mentioned before, work correspondence is, is unlikely to be their personal data. So a, 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 an email sent to a manager summarizing the day's activities or a business, a business issue is unlikely to be their personal, personal data and wouldn't need to be disclosed back to them as part of the subject access request. I suppose it would be potentially personal data if there was a question of their performance in relation to that particular particular piece of work. So, if if the uh, if that piece of work was being cited in a disciplinary process or a performance review meeting, then I could see that the content of it might fall within the definition of personal data. So it can be quite complicated, and it's worth setting the time uh, aside to properly review all of the information that you might have collated. To understand is this is this really about the requester? Is it biographical information that identifies them? So, if, so if we move to the to the next to the next slide, please. I talk about exemptions. I, I think it's as as part of any request, you, you you've got to conduct a reasonable search for the personal data, uh, and that will include obviously looking at your information that's on your own systems. Um, looking at information that you've received from third parties. Sometimes people think because this information has come in from a, a customer or a supplier 
but it, it, it won't it won't include even if it mentions the individual it won't be their personal data well it, it is it is likely to be their personal data and it's something that you would need to disclose back to the back to the requester so th thinking about information that you've received from other people is also is also necessary but there are exemptions some of those exemptions are quite are quite well known are quite um, are, are quite commonly used, and others are more uh, esoteric. And you, and you probably want to look on the ICO website for further information about all of the different exemptions that might might apply. Exemptions are things that you can rely on to explain to an individual why you are not providing them with certain data. And the first exemption is probably the most important one, and the one that I see most frequently used when responding to a, to a subject access request. And that's where providing the individual's personal data will also disclose other people's personal data. This is often the case in, in the employment context where a email might discuss both the individual requester and another employee or a group of employees. Might also discuss customers or in a school, a school, school pupil. So it's often the case that you have mixed personal data within the information that the requester has asked for. In those circumstances, it may be tempting to simply say, your personal data includes other people's personal data, and so we can't uh, disclose it, we can't share it with you. But that's not quite how the exemption works. There is a need to consider whether it's reasonable to nevertheless disclose the requester's personal data to them, notwithstanding the fact that it has other people's personal data mixed in. That reasonableness test is, 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 is quite complicated and needs, again, some careful thinking. These are carrying out a balancing exercise between the individual requester's right to see their personal data and the other person's right for their own personal data to be kept secure and not shared with third parties. So there's a balancing exercise that needs to be undertaken. We need to consider the, the reasonableness of still sharing that information with the requester. If you're not going to share other people's personal data, those are the sorts of things that can be redacted, and we'll talk about reduction in a moment, can be redacted from a, uh, from a document, from perhaps from an email um, where you're, you're you're blacking out the, the references to, to that third party. So it's impossible for the, for the requester to identify who that third party is. I mentioned references on the slide. Confidential employment references given or received are exempt from disclosure as part of a response to a subject access request. So if you, uh, if you are Employing somebody and, and as part of your, uh, your, your checks on their suitability, you're receiving a, a confidential employment reference from their previous employer or a number of previous employers. You don't have to share those references, the content of those references with a individual who makes a subject access request. In the same way, if, if somebody writes to you and says, I'd like to understand what you said about me in a reference, I'm making a subject access request and I'd like to see that you don't have to share that personal data as part of a response to a subject access request. It may be, of course, that there are other reasons why you want to share that personal data, particularly if somebody is alleging that you've uh, discriminated against them or, or victimized them as part of a wider dispute in terms of what, what's been said in a reference. But from a subject access request point of view, there is a specific exemption within GDPR and the UK GDPR around references. I've also mentioned legal professional privilege, because that's sometimes quite important, particularly in a context of a, uh, of a dispute or a wider set of issues that are being faced with, uh, with a particular employee. Communications with a, with a lawyer, with a solicitor, are exempt from disclosure. So you don't need to share the legal advice that you've received with the requester even in circumstances where uh, that legal advice contains their personal data. So it's important to double check what you're sharing with an individual as part of any response to their, 
subject access request to make sure that if there are communications that you've had about that individual with your lawyer, that those communications are, are not included within, within the disclosure. Mark, I've just had a question come in, so I wonder if we can just um, touch on that before you move on. So the question is, if as part of an employee subject access request, a search produces comments in emails made by members of a, a council of a university, what's the position if the, the council members object to the disclosure? Um, and then there's clarification that council members are the most senior decision makers, but not paid employees or remunerated in any other way. Um, so I, I think the question is, can, can somebody object to something being disclosed that's been brought up as part of that search? So, so th th thanks. Thanks for that question. So I suppose in it, the, 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 the answer to that question is no, I don't I don't think they can simply or object. I don't think their objection over rules the requester's right to the personal data that they've requested. I suppose what I would want to understand is why they are objecting, what their uh, particular c concern is about the, the disclosure, and if it involves the council members' personal data, that you're then once you understand a bit their objection, that you're then able to carry out that balancing exercise to understand whether it's reasonable to nevertheless disclose personal data to the requester. Of course, there is no uh, exemption for uh, embarrassing uh, information. So, you know, sometimes people say, well, well, the right to the, the, the personal data is factual information. Well, that's not correct. It, it, it will include factual information, so a record of somebody's annual leave or, or whatever it might be, but it is also going to include opinions about, about the requester. So, uh, so an assessment of somebody's um, performance or attributes, um, and as I said, even if it's an embarrassing thing, which the, the, the person who's written that email or, or made those comments uh, perhaps regrets or reflects on, um, that's not exempt from. From disclosure on the on the face of it, unless we can find a particular exemption uh, under the GDPR that applies. Great, thanks very much, Mark. So I think I think that's picked up a second question that's coming. Is someone's opinion about somebody else the requester considered to be their personal data? Um, yes, I think in in the in the is the is the is the short short answer to, to that. So it's likely to to be captured. Uh, within within the request, but you'd still want to consider um, you'd still want to consider the other exemptions that might might apply. There's no exemption to respond to a request if the request is felt to be too wide, or administratively burdensome, or um, or complicated, and that's why getting the IT people involved at an early stage or in advance so you can easier locate the personal data is. Um, is, re is really helpful. The GDPR does talk about the opportunity to reject a request if it's what, what it calls manifestly excessive. Again, unhelpfully, there's, there's no real sort of unpacking of what manifestly excessive looks like, but the general interpretation is that that is a very, very high threshold indeed, and it's the sort of thing that you'd have to justify, and it's the sort of thing that if you ended up being challenged in, a, in the ICO or in the court, you'd really have to work quite hard, I think, to justify why a request was manifestly excessive. You really have to, I think, work very hard indeed. So I think, sorry, Tim. No, sorry, do you finish? Uh, I, I can see we've had one more question come in. Shall I move on to that? Or... Yeah, please do, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So th this is this is one um, which is about um, narrow key HR and whether um, legal privilege uh, applies to to advice that we provide, and, and it doesn't. And so, um, where the narrow key team are working with a client, we always make it absolutely clear at the outset that legal privilege doesn't apply to the work that that we do. And so, you know. We work on the basis that anything has got the potential to be disclosed, 
Um, for example, we regularly carry out investigations for clients and we will always prepare the investigation reports on the basis that they could be disclosed in full. There might be reasons why you don't do that in the first instance, but um, we would always work on the basis that they could be. And we do get subject access requests in increasingly, actually, um, particularly from employees who perhaps raise grievances. Naraki may be um, instructed to carry out an investigation into that grievance and then the employee at the end of the process may put in a subject access request both to the employer and also to Naraki HR sometimes to um, either try to get hold of a full investigation report or various um, communications that have gone um, between us during the during the process. So, but we so it doesn't apply. But we're very clear about that from the outset, um, and so we are careful about how we manage communications. Th th thanks, thanks, Caitlin. The, the the only other thing I wanted to say is that requesters have a right to see a copy of their personal data. That doesn't actually mean that they have the right to see the document that their personal data is in. And, and so it's reasonable for the person responding to that request to pull personal data contained perhaps in an email, series of emails or minutes of meetings, to pull that personal data into a separate document and disclose that separate document to the individual in response to their request. That can be uh, quite time consuming uh, and sometimes uh, it's a bit of a judgment call as to whether that's the right approach or the uh, the better approach is to uh, is to send a redacted bundle of papers documents to to the individual but it's a point worth reflecting on uh, when you're looking at one of those really large uh, requests which has got lots of information in lots of different places but let's move on to the next the next slide uh, which is about uh, when you when it's time to respond you you need to keep a a note of the exemptions that you've you've relied on. That's really important because if there is a challenge in the future, or you get that letter from the ICO through the door saying we think you've you've not disclosed everything you ought to have disclosed, or we've received a complaint from an individual that you've not done that, then you're going to need to uh, explain and justify in most cases the exemptions that you've relied on. It's always really helpful to keep a record of what what is sent so that if there's any um, question about whether everything has been sent or some ambiguity about what was what was sent uh, that you've got a copy on your file and you can say well we did provide all of the all of the information the gdpr says that certain additional what it calls supplementary information must be provided to a requester um, at the time when you're responding to their subject access request and that supplementary information is basically the information that you you put in a privacy notice it tells people uh, what personal data you process about them, why you process it, um, the legal justifications for processing it, um, and sets out the right for an individual to, uh, to talk to the ICO, to complain to the ICO if they wish to do so. So you need to provide that information at the same time as responding. And finally, probably a fairly basic point, but it, it does bear repeating, you need to send the information secure, securely back to the individual who's requested it. Um, you should generally provide it uh, electronically uh, unless the requester asks for it in a, in a, different, in a different way. Um, but whichever way you, you do it, it's best to, to uh, make sure you're sending it securely. The worst, the worst thing to do would be to send it you know, in, in the post or something to the wrong, wrong address and somebody then has got hold of a whole raft of personal data relating to the requester. So I'm, I, I, a question come in, sorry, Mark. Yeah. Um, it says if, if emails are deleted and not held by an organization or by any party, can it be argued that this information should be somehow retrieved and sent after a, a subject access request? Well, that's a, that's a really, that's a really great question. Th thanks for that, because you, you, first of all, you've got to, you've, you've got to undertake a reasonable search for, for the requester's personal data. And there will be a question then about how, how, how many steps you take to retrieve correspondence or, or emails that perhaps have been deleted. I suppose it depends on how easy it is to, uh, to, to retrieve that personal data. If the emails have been you know, genuinely deleted and the only way to get hold of them would be to bring in some sort of forensic IT experts to search the the, the computer systems 
then I think that's probably too too high a, a burden. And I think if they've genuinely been deleted and they're not just sat in a in an archive that's easily accessible or the IT team can easily get hold of them, then I think then 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 you no longer hold their their personal data. That you know I think that there's often a um, a, a, a sensible approach here, and I'll, I'll talk about re document retention a little bit later because this is part of that about you know, keeping keeping your records ca carefully reviewed and only holding the personal data that you need to hold. Of course, that's an obligation under the GDPR anyway. Um, but uh, where you have people who who leave employment, that you're you're, you're not just keeping their their records on file, uh, perhaps for the for the sake of it, or or because you've not sort of reviewed what you're what you're retaining, but you you have in place a sort of retention schedule, which um, after a certain amount of time, um, under that retention schedule, you then sort of clean up the documents and delete what you no longer need to hold. So I think good, that's a really good practice is to is to remove information that you don't you don't need, and then respond if you are then asked for that information to say we simply don't hold that personal data any longer. So thank thanks very much for that for that question. Then we move on from. Uh, subject access requests now, but of course, if there are questions about about those areas, oh, sorry, the, 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 this is just the the, the 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 what happens if it all goes wrong slide. So I won't I won't stay here too long. Um, complaints to the ICA, so the ICA can deal with a complaint from an in individual about what was said in their in their subject access request response. Um, the data subject themselves can co contact the court and try and get a court order requiring. Uh, an employer or business to disclose their personal data and criminal offence. I mentioned that because, and I suppose it ties in a little bit with that last question, it's actually a criminal offence to delete or destroy or deprive a requester deliberately uh, of their personal data. So if you receive a personal data and then delete the emails that you ought to be disclosing, that's actually a criminal offence. That's different, of course, to uh, having a, a practice of regularly cleaning up inboxes and removing information that you no longer need to keep before a request is received. It's where you do that after the request is received that you can get in more, more uh, trouble, let's put it like that. So on, on, to, the next, uh, on to the next slide. Um, as I've said, away from subject access requests, but appreciate that it's an interesting topic. So do, do let me know if there's other questions. I was going to talk a little about Security again, a really key part of the um, of the GDPR and obligations on uh, on, on employers. Um, the obligation under the GDPR is to take appropriate technical and organisational measures. M much of this is going to involve working closely with your IT teams, IT departments, the people you use for the for the provision of of, of IT systems to make sure that they're using the right technological uh, steps and protections, whether it's antivirus, software, um, firewalls, all of those sorts of, sorts of things that are in place in order to protect the personal data that you hold, whether about staff or other, other individuals. Pseudo anonymization, encryption, those are all tools uh, which you ought to consider when you're keeping employee personal data on an electronic system. So pseudo anonymization is where you, you have perhaps certain spreadsheets containing, containing information about, about individuals um, and they don't identify the individuals by, by name or include personal data such as date, dates of birth, but include only the information that might be needed, for instance, to run a payroll system. Um, encryption, again, that's an IT systems uh, requirement. There's a the, the GDPR talks about confidentiality, integrity, availability, and resilience, which it calls very excitingly the CIA. Um, that's again a, a fairly self-evident the steps that you need to you need to take to think about uh, protecting personal data, backing information up, and then evaluating, so testing and assessing the steps that you're taking to protect personal data. So if we go on to the next, the next slide, data breach. I mean, it, data breach is something that gets in the news a lot. Um, we know that uh, ransomware 
attacks um, are becoming common ransomware is where uh, so, so, some some somebody um, in, somehow installs on a on a system a virus uh, and then a um, an email or message is received by the unfortunate organization from the ransom uh, attackers to say that unless uh, money is paid or certain steps are taken that personal data will then be will then be leaked there will be a data breach whether it's customer data or employee data um, so steps need to be taken to try to minimize that that risk and i suppose a lot of that is about antivirus systems but it's also about making sure that staff know uh, what steps they can take to um, to protect personal data that's on the systems to avoid um, encountering viruses coming into contact with viruses whether it's not clicking attachments from emails that they don't know the recipient of th those sort of those sort of steps I think it is incumbent upon an employer to to, to, to make sure its staff know uh, about the risks in, in relation to this. Deliberate breaches, leaking, again it's hard for an employer to uh, to defend against an individual who's taken uh, deliberate steps to, to damage their organization. But it does happen. And unfortunately, the, the simply explaining to the ICO that a data breach was caused by a, um, an employee deliberately or somebody who, for whatever reason, bore a grudge to an employer, that, that, that won't of itself be a sufficient defense to the, to the ICO when they challenge a, a particular data breach. They will still expect the employer to have taken all reasonable steps to stop the or minimize the risk of such such breaches taking place. So of course, training staff, I've mentioned that, that's really important, but making sure that the, the only staff who have access to personal data are those who, in, who are in trusted senior positions um, or, or and or are aware of the of the risks of the risks around inadvertent disclosure and inadvertent disclosure I mentioned on the third bullet points email problems uh, it's certainly the case that I think most um, e e most data breaches come out of emails that are sent to um, sent sent to the wrong recipient or contain information that they ought not to have contained. Um, th that's, that's, that's an area which, which I think is, is, is really worthy of constant, uh, constant review and training by, by employers to try to minimize the risks of, um, of, of emails going awry or information being disclosed incorrectly. On the next slide, I talk about a really unfortunate uh, case, which got quite a lot of, uh, of, of press coverage actually involving uh, HIV Scotland, HIV Scotland, which is a charity um, in Scotland, uh, who sent uh, a, 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 an email uh, inadvertently, uh, unsecurely. What what they did is that they, they they had an event that they were they were looking to promote, uh, and I think uh, the email went out to about a hundred, a hundred, um, hundred people on their mailing list, and rather than using the BCC option, the blind copy option, uh, they, uh, th th they used CC, the ca carbon copy. So that meant that each recipient of the email saw the email address of every other recipient. And I think around 60 of those email addresses were, um, were quite clear who the individual was. So it had the, an individual's name, like Mark Stevens of BWV. So, um, as a consequence of that, the ICA investigated, um, and as part of their, their their decision, they identified that the the, the training wasn't up to scratch, um, didn't happen before employees joined, or at least at the early stages of them joining. It happened over time after they joined. Um, that there were no real written procedures, written documents in place around data security. And, uh, and the training um, uh, uh, and what training people should, should expect. Uh, and, and that they'd also had issues, I think, in the past with, 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 the, with the blind copy function. So 
HIV Scotland were, were, were fined £10,000, even though they're a charity, even though they, they, the disclosure was, um, was inadvertent, of course. Uh, and the information in the email uh, was, was simply an invite or raising awareness of upcoming uh, events. Um, so it didn't reveal, I suppose, what one might say, an individual's own personal data, but the fact, the fact that it identified uh, the recipients of, of correspondence from a HIV charity was sufficient to amount to a, to a data breach. So a real cautionary tale, it's not the first time that, 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 uh, that, that an organisation has been um, in trouble, the ICA, for failing to use uh, the BCC option. I know that there, were, there, was a, there was another case some years ago involving the, um, a similar situation where the, the email recipients were put in the two header. So cl clearly the, the email, emails are one area where there, are, there is real risk to, to an organisation. So thinking about how, how, what steps can be taken to minimise that risk, I think is really, truly really valuable. If we go on to the next, the next slide. Um, I talk here a little bit about the risks, but again, much of this is, is fairly self-evident. Um, the ICO has power to do quite, quite significant damage with, with fines. Um, the the 17.5 million is the headline, but, but the, it, it, invariably the, the, the sort of fines will be, will be lower than that. But, but as you can see, the fact that perhaps it was a charity involved in an inadvertent data breach wasn't sufficient to, to mean that a fine wasn't, wasn't charged. Even if, even if something doesn't end up in front of the ICO, there's going to be a lot of resource and management time uh, involved in, 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 in picking up the pieces after a data breach, uh, whether it's contacting the data subjects to explain what's, what's happened or, or reporting things to the ICO. So it's clearly better to try and avoid those sort of situations. There is also personal liability and the risk of compensation claims. I'm going to talk a moment in a moment about a couple of cases in relation to compensation, but people are switched on now to the fact that they can uh, they, they can seek compensation for uh, for their injury to feelings for for hurt for damage caused as a consequence of a of a data breach. I'm just going to go on to the to the next to the next slide, please. So the next slide mentions a couple of recent cases which involve data breaches. And, and actually these cases are quite helpful and it's certainly worth bearing in mind if, you, if you're dealing with a, um, a, a response to a, to a request for, um, sorry, a, a response to a, to, to a data breach or somebody saying that their personal data has been shared inadvertently. Um, the, 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 the Lloyd case against, against Google um, was a, a case uh, pursued against the, 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 search, the search engine, and it ended up in the Supreme Court, so the highest court in, in the UK. And it was a question about whether somebody could pursue compensation where there has been a loss of control of their personal data. And the Supreme Court has said that, that whilst somebody can bring a claim for uh, loss of control, there's no automatic right to compensation simply because there has been a breach. So it's not enough to say there has been a, there has been a breach and therefore I must be entitled to some compensation. The individual must be able to show that they've suffered some form of, of loss, some form of damages, material damage or, or distress caused by the data breach. The next case, Rolf against Veal was Provisards. You might recognize the name of the defendant in that case, the law firm, the law firm that I work for. The firm uh, were uh, sued by, by an individual because an email uh, was sent uh, to the wrong person. So the uh, recipient of the email uh, was, not the, was not the correct recipient. Um, a, an email was sent by uh, somebody within the firm setting out an obligation uh, that Mr. Rolf had to pay uh, school fees to a client of BWVs. 
the email went to the wrong recipient, uh, somebody whose name was very similar to Mr. Rolf, and set out within it that Mr. Rolf owed a client um, a certain amount of money, setting out the obligation upon Mr. Rolf to pay for that, uh, for, 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 for the money that he, he owed. The, the data breach was recognized and Mr. Rolf was informed that the email had been sent to the wrong recipient uh, and he was unhappy with that and a claim was pursued. Uh, the claim was unsuccessful. The claim was uh, dismissed by the High Court um, on the basis that given the nature of the breach, the information in the breach, the steps that were taken to mitigate that breach, um, that there was no there was no real loss to Mr. Mr. Rolf. Um, actually, the, the decision uh, was, was, was quite strong that the, and I'll quote from the judge, the judge said, the incident was not capable of causing a person of ordinary fortitude in the modern world to suffer the losses, which had been exaggerated. So in this case, given the nature of the inadvertent disclosure, there had been an inadvertent disclosure of personal data, but given the nature of it and the steps taken to mitigate by contacting the, the actual recipient and asking them not to share that personal data any further and then notifying Mr. Rolf, in light of those steps, it couldn't realistically be said that Mr. Rolf had suffered loss or, or damage or upset. So two helpful cases in the event that somebody does uh, pursue a complaint as a consequence of a data breach. Let's go on to the next one. Next slide, please. I'll mention this very briefly um, because I'm no expert on uh, website cookies, but many, many people I'm sure are, are on, this, on this call will have seen uh, when logging into a website, that various pop-ups come up saying, uh, uh, is it okay if we put cookies on your, on your system? Um, th those are there because the GDPR requires those pop-ups to be to be there. If, if a website puts cookies on, uh, on, onto a computer, um, that it, it must do so with, with consent. Um, and actually there is, a, there is a claim for distress caused uh, if, if, if cookies are set without consent. And VWV as a law firm are seeing clients who are receiving claims for distress and upset and anxiety caused by cookies being unlawfully placed on the website. So one to perhaps pass on to the IT team, but do check what your website is doing and saying about, uh, about how cookies are used and, and, and put, onto the, put onto the website. Um, that was everything I had to say about security. So perhaps we can move on to the next, the next slide. Just finally in the time available to us, I was going to mention accountability um, because this is a key part again of the of the ICO, uh, sorry, of the GDPR. And the ICO sets out quite a lot of steps that an organization should take to ensure it's accountable for the data protection processing that it, that it does. Um, data protection by design and default is, the, is, a, is, a, is a key almost slogan really, uh, which, which is about how the decisions that you make as, a, as an organization must have data protection at their, at their forefront. So when you're introducing a new computer system or you're introducing a new way of uh, engaging with staff, you're thinking about uh, data protection issues, privacy issues as, as part and parcel of, of that uh, new process. So if we, if we go on to the next slide, please, Emma, thank you. Privacy notices are a really important part of the, uh, of, of the, of the accountability obligation. Uh, you as an employer should be telling your employees what personal data you hold on them. You should be telling them why you hold it, what you do with it, and the, the, the legal uh, reasons, the justifications for processing their personal data. That information must be given to employees at the time when you, you, you're, you're processing their personal data. So they, they really should be given at the time when, at least when employment starts. So it's important to have those privacy notices in place, easily accessible uh, by staff, whether it's on the intranet or given in a hard copy to employees when, when they join. A layered approach is uh, 
uh, something that you'll see the ICO talk about. It's about uh, it's about making sure that that the documentation uh, that that is given reflects the individuals who receive it, uh, and that you're taking a uh, an approach which is uh, on the basis of need to know. So you you have certain individuals within your organisation who need to know a lot about personal data, but perhaps other people who who don't need access to as much um, as much information. Data collection forms are those sorts of things that you provide to uh, new starters about monitoring, so equal opportunities monitoring. You need to be really clear in those sorts of forms about what you're doing with the information. You need to explain, uh, I would recommend that that information isn't used as part of it, any decision making that you take about the particular employee, um, but it's used for perhaps uh, keeping a record of, 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 of where people are from. Um, or people's backgrounds as part of your, your general sort of a, approach to equality and thinking about equality matters. If we go on to the next slide, please. Policies, yeah, again, a really important part of, part of this. I've talked about some of this in relation to data security. Part of thinking about how to defend a potential fine from the ICO is, is about making sure that you can explain that staff understand their obligations understand how to send emails, understand how to use the BCC function, um, that they're trained in that, um, and, and that those groups who are handling a lot of personal data, um, so particularly for those of us who are joining from sort of HR teams, that they, they've really got specific training and they know, uh, they, they know what, they're, what they're doing, what the expectations are um, around, around the steps that they're taking. So if we go to the next slide. So there's there's lots of other documents, and I won't I won't touch upon these in any great detail. Um, there, there there's lots of other things that you'll need as a as an employer to uh, to document. Um, GDPR is a lot about having the records, having the information to evidence what steps have been taken, and that you've thought about data protection. Consent. If you're relying on consent for processing activity, you need to have a, a that that consent uh, doc, doc in a document. Legitimate interest assessments, if you're saying that um, you're processing personal data because you have a legitimate interest in doing that, you need to keep a documented assessment of that process. Um, special category personal data is sensitive personal data and you need to think about why you're retaining that. ROPA stands for a record of processing activities. That's about uh, keep keeping a document on file which explains what you're doing with personal data and why. Data breach procedure, data breach procedure, we've talked about data breaches, keeping a register of each data breach and the training that you've undertaken after each data breach and the mitigating steps that you've taken to minimize risk is important. Retention schedule, a document that you keep on your system, which explains, uh, explains how long you keep personal data for and why you keep it for that long. So perhaps thinking about whether you need to keep uh, everybody's HR files for 20 years, I would say almost certainly not. You, you would keep some information perhaps for six years post termination of employment in order that you can defend potential complaints, breach of contract claims in a, in a high court, but no longer. I don't think it's necessary to keep things uh, forever. Data protection impact assessments. When you're, when you're engaged in high risk um, activity as a data uh, controller, you need to carry out a data protection impact assessment first. So if you're introducing some, some software which will track what your employees are doing or, um, or not doing, um, you need to do a data protection impact assessment first because it's a very privacy intrusive um, activity. So you need to weigh up the, 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 the implications for privacy within a DPIA. And finally, again, one for, one for sort of the, 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 the business thinking about its arrangements with data processors. So people who are doing things with personal data on your behalf, you've got an agreement in place with those processes about the way that they are using personal data. I think if we go on to the next slide, there's a few polling questions here, Caitlin, but um, first of all, um, do let me know if there's any other questions in terms of some of the things that I've talked about. There are some questions, so um, let's run through those before we go on to the polling um, questions. So there's one question asking, is encryption enough? So if your system is encrypted, do you still need to password protect documents? 
I, I suppose it, it, it's probably having that layered approach and thinking about 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 different approaches for really sensitive information. I could see that that perhaps it, it depends on what in, encryption encryption means, and that's probably an, an an IT question in the first instance. But then, when is that sufficient? It depends on how many people, I suppose, have access to it, how many people can unencrypt it, um, and whether you need an, an added layer of protection for really sensitive information. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another one, if we have a third party HR system, do we need to do a data protection impact assessment for it? Yeah, I think that I think that's a really good, I think that's a really good idea actually, where 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 you're you're, you're contracting out HR services or any services which are going to involve a lot of personal data being processed. I think that's a really sensible thing. You can't be criticized for doing an impact assessment which weighs up the risks where you consider things like how the information is transferred, what security measures are in place at the HR um, advisory service that you use. So yeah, I, th I think that's a great idea. Okay, we've had a couple more just pop up. We have an issue about keeping data of employees who have industrial diseases and come to light only now. We keep data for 40 years for those employees who may be affected. Yeah, I, I think if, if there's if there's a, a need to keep the personal data, then that's that's fine. I think I think it's about being able to justify that if you are if you are challenged. And I could see in a, in the context of of needing to keep information around potential injuries that people might have sustained or be un, unaware of sustaining, so sort of a latent personal injury. Um, I think I think that would be right to keep. To keep information I think, I think you could justify that it's about then documenting documenting it and putting it in a retention schedule so you're transparent with people about what you're keeping why you're keeping it and how long you are keeping it for brilliant and then a last question just before we go on to our sort of final slides is what about where a subject access request does not appear to be genuine so the individual is being very difficult over a number of issues not necessarily related to data and then um makes a specific request or requests a specific email um the individual didn't provide an opportunity to respond to that before making what appears to be a subject access request a day or so later would it be acceptable to provide the requested document and seek clarification that they're actually making a subject access request given their behavior to date yeah, that's that that that's that's complicated. Uh, I, I think that, that 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 it's certainly reasonable to ask for clarification and ask to, to better understand what they are what they are looking for and to to check whether they 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 are actually making a subject access request or they that they, they're asking a specific question or for other information because if they're asking a question or information about something other than themselves, then that's not a subject access request. So I think having a dialogue communication with people is is absolutely fine. Um, but perhaps to cover oneself, um, you know, saying something along the lines of well, we will treat this as a as a subject access request unless you notify, notify us otherwise, and we will be in touch within the, the relevant time limits with the personal data that, that we think you've requested. So I think I think it's being cautious, but at the same time communicating with the individual.